Well, good morning and welcome here uh, to London for the first webinar of the series that I have had the privilege of, uh, of chairing this year. And we're here today to talk with Alice Sherwood. Alice is a Senior Visiting Research Fellow at the Policy Institute at King's College London. And she has written a fascinating book, which we'll be, come into, uh, we'll be coming to in a moment. Uh, but today's topic is the curious economics of authenticity. Now, we all want to be authentic, don't we? Who wants to be inauthentic? But Alice has taken and explored this topic in a way that I think you're going to find enlightening and refreshing, as I did. Uh, I had the privilege of meeting Alice, uh, due, oddly, to the Hey on Why Book Festival, but interestingly, not at the festival itself. I had been taken around to a little celebration on a on an estate in Wales and bumped into her due to our dear friend, George Littlejohn, who said, I absolutely must uh, have Alice on the program. Uh, having then forced me to purchase one of her books, I then took it away and read it and found out that I, uh, George was absolutely correct. I was truly entranced. So we'll, we'll get on to that in just a moment. Uh, but for those of you who are joining us for the first time this year, just a reminder that we can only do this thanks to the generosity and tolerance of all of our sponsors who allow us to range widely and freely across technology, economics, and finance. Uh, and uh, today's program will follow a fairly standard format that we have, or our authentic format, may I say, uh, which is uh, I'm here to get out of the way as quickly as possible so you can hear from our expert. Uh, Alice will be speaking for approximately 20 minutes and has uh, prepared some slides to help talk us through, not the book itself, although you should purchase it, uh, but through the thinking that led to it and some of the implications. And we'll then move on to 20 minutes of Q&A. So three quick elements of housekeeping. Uh, firstly, yes, the slides are available and I believe are already posted in the chat room. Uh, secondly, yes, this will be uh, is being recorded and will be posted in approximately two working days, so about midday on Wednesday, for you to share with colleagues and friends. Uh, and three, uh, yes, uh, how do I participate in the Q&A? We would love you to do so and simply type questions into the uh, question and answer facility here on GoToWebinar. A uh, reminder that all of your questions with your emails attached will be sent to Alice. So even if it's not a question, it's just, hi, Alice, I'd like to talk to you about X. Just send it in and we'll make sure that she gets uh, everything that's there or thank her or tell, tell her what uh, other areas you think she, she should look at or that you would like to look at. It's all open, free and friendly, and we would uh, like you to participate. So um, with no further ado, Alice, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to George, if you happen to be there for... Um making the introduction. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I believe we're starting with a poll uh, where we might discover uh -huh, um, uh, how honest or otherwise is the N FS club uh, audience is uh, yeah. and asking them whether they've told a lie within the last 24 hours. Uh, and this is um, similar to some research that was carried out in 1996. So in that one, they asked, uh, how many lies have you told within the last 24 hours? And then well, it was our, an our, <laughs> our audience is very quick off the mark. So we've got the results already. Fantastic. Um, I'm not sure I believe them, though. <laughs> they, uh, 76 wow. believe they have not told a lie in the last 24 hours. So. Uh, what was your, what were your results, Alice? Uh, well, the results from that particular survey was that on average people told 1.5 lies a day uh, and didn't feel at all bad about it. Uh, research also revealed that. And to put that in context, the 45th president of the United States uh, told an average of 21 lies a day during his presidency. And Michael, I know you like a range, uh, so. Uh, that ranged from year one, uh, where he tended to, on average, tell six lies a day, to year four and before the elections, where he was up to 39 lies a day. So he, he did a lot better than George Washington. <laughs> did so well. Um, first slide, please. Uh, so the problem of falsification of information is one of, I would say, the few problems of authenticity that almost everybody shares. And the other one I would say now uh, is Russia's egregious lie uh, that it is not conducting a war in Ukraine, uh, which is again, uh, uh, an inauthenticity that is affecting us all. 
But in general, concerns about authenticity tend to be very specific. Uh, so it is a very fragmented picture. Everyone has their own piece of the jigsaw. And it was a jigsaw I was keen to put together to try and get a bigger picture. But of course, for instance, in academia, we worry about cut and paste essays. How do you know the person you're meeting online is who they say they are? Um, the latest iteration of GPT-3 uh, makes uh, chatbots extraordinarily human and so on, advertise concern about bots and luxury good counterfeits, as people know, are skyrocketing. Uh, and this is, of course, um, a concern very specifically, if you wouldn't mind the next slide, please, uh, a, a particular concern for business. And here is one outfit uh, that is doing a lot of good work uh, in anti-counterfeiting, they're called Securing Industry. And you'll just see the range of industries from pharmaceuticals to cosmetics, fashion. Uh, bottom left, you'll see, uh, I think it's called security documents and IT. And that's where they're looking at the sort of things that get reported on action fraud, the action fraud line, but also sort of banknote counterfeits, document counterfeits. And counterfeits is a very, very ingenious. Um, it's very difficult to stay ahead of them. And if you look at right at the top, you'll see the poor old Tasmanian cherry exporter um, whose anti-counterfeiting um, technologies were copied by the counterfeiters almost immediately. Um, so as I said, my aim was very much to look at the big picture and also to take a long view and to look at the underlying forces in this presentation of evolution and economics um, I know we won't have time for me to talk about technology during the presentation, but I put a slide about it at the end uh, and perhaps people might be interested in asking questions about it. But the big question for me is, if, as we say we do, we care a lot about authenticity, why is it that we're so bad at it? Why are there inauthenticities everywhere? Um, next slide, please. So I've said I'd like to take the broad view. I also think it is important to take the long view. Uh, and we really do seem to be talking about authenticity an awful lot at the moment. This is a Google engram. So that is a mapping of all the mentions of a particular word, in this case, authenticity, in the millions and millions of books that it's, it, Google has scanned in this case since uh, 1800. Um, and you'll see that mentions of authenticity go up pretty sharply at the end of the 20th century. And then the gradient really does get steep um, at the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, authenticity really is a 21st century preoccupation. And I would say there's two things, reasons for this, and they're really it's partly to do with what we mean by authenticity. So the original meaning of authenticity, uh, which goes back, I think, to the 14th century, was something was authentic if it was in accordance with the facts. Uh, and often it meant legally valid. It was a legal term for quite a while, with lawyers even being called authentics, unusual, uh, we would say now. And um, uh, and that really is the, still the primary usage. So we, it is something, we mean it in the sense of facts, empirical facts that can be checked, facts that can be argued about to get to an authoritative picture, another meaning for authenticity. Um, it's objective and of course it's public. So I, next slide please, because something interesting has happened more recently, which is that there's been a new more recent meaning of authenticity uh, has come into play. Um, I would say you can trace it back about 300 years to the Romantics. And this one is about feelings. It's about internal reality. It's what people are talking about when they talk about my truth. Uh, and it's about self-discovery and self-understanding. It's subjective and it's private. And it will not escape your notice that these two meeting meanings are almost completely opposite. We're using the same word to mean 
two almost completely opposite things. And so it is really a good idea um, to be clear which one we're talking about at any point. And I, next slide please, am very much in this presentation talking about the left-hand side, the factual authenticity. So I tell a dozen or so stories in the book, but for today I've picked out a few here where I thought what I call the curious economics were intriguing uh, and illuminating. Um, so these stories are The Imposter I Knew, The Anatomy of a Contract, Nature's Unconscious Deceivers, a little bit about runaway competition uh, and um, the authenticity of things. So if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, I can come to the first one. The germ of the idea of this book came when I found that one of my closest friends, who was also a colleague, was a fantasist and a fabulist. And almost everything he told me about his life uh, was not true. Uh, and what he told me are what I now know to be uh, the four or five main lies that people like that tell. So they should be a red flag if you hear any of them, uh, that he was related to aristocracy, that he had a sympathy inducing but non-fatal illness and also a sympathy inducing tragedy in his background. And what I call the James Bond lie that he was doing secret, very important work. Uh, I didn't spot any of them. I like I, I do want to point out that this was before the internet, and I like to think uh, that I would be able to do a Google search now uh, and establish that they weren't true. But what he had on his side, and all good imposters have, is a symmetry of information at that point. The second thing he did uh, was to become engaged to two of my friends that he had met through me simultaneously. Now, in those days, a fiancé was very much what we would call a rival good, meaning that type of good that can only be possessed by a single user at any one time. So two fiancés uh, is one too many. And where he really came a cropper was that if you have two fiancés simultaneously, you can get away with Christmas because you can say you're spending that time with your family but New Year is a date you have to spend with your betrothed. And as it happened, this was in 1999. And the New Year was the Millennium New Year's Eve, which you definitely have to spend with your fiancé and which is very tricky to do if you have two fiancés. Um, next slide, please. Now, I'd like to distinguish imposters from con artists. Um, because to my mind, imposters are those who are effectively deceiving to achieve for personal achievement. So what I call the fake it till you make it brigade. Uh, whereas con, con artists are uh, only out for themselves. And we have two of them here on the left. We have Yellow Kid Wile, uh, who man who claimed to inv have invented the wire fraud, uh, as in the film The Sting. And then on the right, uh, you'll all recognise Elizabeth Holmes uh, of Theranos, uh, which was at one point valued at nine billion dollars. Um, but in fact, her biotech, her promised biotech miracle equipment never worked. And the interesting thing to me here is that although 100 years apart, they follow the same playbook to the letter. It's fascinating. The anatomy of the con is always the same. The second thing I found interesting is the difference. A con artist is what you might call a wholly rational econ, a wholly rational economic man or woman. Um, they, they make their decisions based on rational analysis of potential and de desired outcomes. They're very cool customers. And I think, and it seems, that they most often succeed when their victims are the sort of people who are liable to be subject to cognitive biases, uh, which are the quirks or errors of modes of thought that um, make us um, less than rational. Uh, so, for instance, uh, the victims will tend 
to have confirmation bias, they will um, uh, select information that supports their existing belief and often in this case that the get rich quick scheme will indeed get them rich. Uh, they are positive, positive Pollyannas. Uh, they will ignore beliefs uh, that conflict with what they want to know, their cognitive dissonance. But the most interesting thing is that all good con men know that the best person to con is the one that you've conned before because they are dying to make back what they've lost. And that is a real telltale sign of the victim, which is that they have a very poor grasp of the sunk cost issue. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. What I found completely fascinating was to think about whether we are in some way biologically wired to deceive. And I started looking at nature and I thought one of the most interesting things there was that it is absolutely rife with deception, uh, particularly or only when deception is a matter of ensuring survival or um, grabbing hold, if animals can be said to grab hold, of scarce resources. Um, biologist uh, Professor Stephen Jones, who Steve Jones, who you may have come across, um, put it this way. He said, if you want honesty, don't look at biology, try physics instead. And one example here are these very beautiful butterflies. Um, on the left is the monarch butterfly. And the monarch butterfly is in fact poisonous or unpalatable, and its bright colours were a warning to predators uh, to keep away, and if a predator has taken a, a corner out of them once, they will never do so again. On the right, slightly smaller uh, and very hard to distinguish, is something called the Viceroy butterfly, which has long been believed to be harmless, uh, but still copies the warning signals of the monarch butterfly and is obviously free riding on the fact that the monarch um, is poisonous um, and giving a false signal uh, to predators. And the way that this astonishing mimicry, and it really is astonishing, has come about is that every splodge of colour that made the original Viceroy butterfly look a little bit more like a poisonous butterfly, helped it to survive, uh, it would have offspring that then had those markings, and again in the next generation those butterflies that looked a little bit more like the poisonous butterflies survived and bred, and so on and down the generations until you get this really really astonishing uh, imitation. Obviously, I've called them nature's, nature's unconscious deceivers because they're not deciding to deceive. The choice here is made by natural selection, uh, Darwinian evolution and adversarial competition. So I would say that there is an invisible hand at work. And in this case, it's the invisible hand of evolution. Um, next slide, please. And uh, two more, a couple more unconscious deceivers, my favourite. Mr. and Mrs. Cuckoo Finch, who are in the middle, uh, and they have worked out that childcare and food are scarce resources, and therefore they lay their eggs in the nest of other birds and leave them to do all the work themselves. In this case, the little tawny prinia on the left. Even more than that, uh, the prinia manages to evolve some very detailed patterned and coloured eggs so that she can distinguish hers from the interlopers. And pretty soon the cuckoo finch has evolved, those are the ones on the right uh, of the egg picture, um, to match. So this is an extraordinary example of an egg race, if you like, that is also an arms race, counterfeiter versus detective, um, and um, competition really to stay ahead of the competition and the beautiful results remind me very much of the fact that to my mind uh, banknotes um, uh, 
get more ingenious and more beautiful with every iteration uh, where, where they are trying to um, get the better of the latest counterfeiters. Next slide, please. And since we're on the subject, of course, of unbridled and runaway competition, I, I do need to point out that although we got those beautiful results from um, inter-species um, arms races, uh, sometimes runaway and unbridled competition can lead to very poor results, particularly if they're within a particular group or species. And I'm sure you will have all come across the Darwin economy by Cornell econom economist Robert Frank. And if you haven't, I really do commend it to you. And the example he uses are the elk's antlers, which are have evolved to be ridiculously large, sometimes up to four or five foot in width, um, simply because uh, in the breeding season, it is the elk with the bull elk with the biggest antlers um, who has access to the most lady elks. Uh, and obviously, uh, then the offspring have larger antlers and so on, it grows again. Uh, over the generations. But here the problem is that what is good for one elk, big antlers, is very bad for the species as a whole uh, because huge antlers are a complete waste of time uh, and energy and resources, especially as they have to shed them and regrow them every year. They are ridiculously costly and there is a huge opportunity cost to them. And Robert Frank points out that really what the elks need uh, are Antler, what he calls antler limitation talks. Um, if they could just cut their antlers back by half, they would get um, the same benefit at a lower cost. But until now, uh, no elks have seen fit to do this. And the reason this is relevant, because that is not directly to do with authenticity, is that cheating always, almost always happens in the shadow of this kind of competition. And you have only to think of sport such as athletics, where if one athlete cheats uh, and takes drugs, the others feel that they have to cheat to compete and take the drugs as well. And very soon you have a situation where athletes are damaging their health, sport is in disrepute, and again what was good for one athlete is bad for the group, and of course the solution there is regulation, in this case uh, the World Anti-Doping Agency, um, WADA, uh, got in on the act. Um, next slide please taking it at quite a lick, um, I wanted just to say that what we most often talk about authenticity, as we saw with the securing industry slide, is about the authenticity of things, so art, designer good, food and beverage, and pharmaceutical. And there are just a few points I, I would like to make here, uh, which is the authenticity of things is what I would call definitional rather than intentional, because obviously things can't decide, like a con man, whether to be authentic or not, and they are not um, moulded by evolution in the way uh, that our animal deceivers were. Um, most often when we say things are authentic, we mean authored by or authorised by, or we refer to the origin or the provenance or the materials. That something is made from. Uh, the second point I wanted to make, since one I'm asked most often, is whether authentic means the same as true, uh, and the answer is that they're related, but no, they don't mean the same, uh, because something can be true and good, so Mandela won the, the Nobel Prize, it's good and true, they can be good, true and neutral, that the earth goes around the sun, or they can be true and bad, if you're referring to a pile-up on the N6 last week, it's true that it happened, um, but it's bad. And the real difference is that authenticity is what emotivists would call a hurrah word. Almost always when you say something is authentic, you mean it's good. Um, uh, and not only that it's good, but that it is some way, in some way it has value or that it is important. Um, you wouldn't bother to define something as authentic if it wasn't worth something. And the third point is that when we're dealing with objects that we think are valuable, um, we define them in such a way as to maximise scarcity, well, maximise, ensure scarcity and maximise our control over them. And this is where you find something interesting, which is 
often when people define authenticity of an object, but for the purposes of authentication, they do it in such a way as to exclude. Uh, authentication is often an exercise in exclusion, so that if you want to know what makes something a painting or a designer good, authentic, often the trick is to ask, as opposed to what? Is to look at the negative, and this was, if they're philosophers in the audience, they'll know that this is J.L. Austin's point. So for instance, a Rembrandt picture is one painted by the master himself and not by the pupils in his studio. Um, we don't expect Ralph Lauren to have made the polo shirt himself, but an authentic Ralph Lauren is made in a licensed factory, not an unlicensed, as opposed to an unlicensed factory. Um, real cream, uh, so the EU tells us, and, and to, to cheers from Big Dairy, is cream that comes from a cow, um, and not cream that, like oat milk, that is made from a plant. So interestingly, at the moment, you can still have plant meat. So veggie burgers and veggie sausages are still allowed. And what makes an authentic bolognese? Ragu, very much up for grabs. No legislation, we can all argue about that one. So I said that there were two meanings, main meanings, factual um, and personal about authenticity. But in truth, there are almost as many meanings for the word authentic as there are people creating the definitions. Um, and the last thing I'd like to say on this slide is that maintaining scarcity and exerting control are not the only reasons for defining authenticity. Sometimes the issues are about safety. Um, and many products can be adulterated and counterfeited in such a way as to be dangerous to people. And I think one of the most egregious examples, and I write about it, is that of the anti-malarial drug artemisinin, which in combination is the best and almost the only cure we have for malaria. And the counterfeiters have moved in on this drug in a big way. And to supply a counterfeit drug or one with a tiny bit of uh, the product, the real product in it, uh, you don't only fail to cure the person, you kill them. So it is cold-blooded murder. Uh, but if you wanted something even worse than that, of course, is counterfeit drugs with a small amount of artemisinin in them um, may well and do, in fact, result in mutant strains that are drug resistant for which there is no cure. And these negative externalities, these spillover effects, are some of the most unforgivable, unforgivable uh, examples of fakery. Um, if I could have the next slide, I know we've almost run out of time with technology. Uh, so next slide again, um, if we could. Uh, I would say uh, the issues with technology, of course, is digital technologies undermine almost everything uh, that have been markers for authenticity that we've discussed, physical precedence or authorizer, restricting restriction of copying, maintaining uniqueness, uh, and all these other things are undermined by digital technologies. So I'd just like to leave you with two thoughts, uh, which is that fakers always move in first and fastest with new technologies. It does take us time to fight back. I don't think we've reached peak fake by any means, but I think we're a lot better at spotting and stopping it. And it's very much early days. Um, the comparable, last comparable technical revolution, the Gutenberg printing press, it took 150 years for the effects to be uh, felt in full. So I remain cautiously optimistic about technology and authenticity. Thank you. Well, that's fantastic. Thanks so much for that, Alice. Um, and I think all of you would agree that uh, this has been a very, very rich uh, counter through a book that is really worth delving into. So please uh, give Alice a bit of warning here because she's she she has a core message without question, but there's so many interesting avenues. And in fact, the book opens up in a, in a way looking more about fakes and things at the start. And as you start to read the book, you sort of think it's all about fake. And I think you had a lovely quote there, what one man can make, another can fake, uh, <laughs> which, I, which I enjoy. Uh, so our first question uh, is from Bob McDowell, and he's sort of asking, how would you differentiate between authenticity 
and replication? Is it a question of motive or objective? And sorry, what was the last bit? The is uh, it how, how would you differentiate between authenticity and replication? Yeah. Um, well, uh, I think firstly the distinction is entirely in the mind or in the power of the person the person making that distinction. So um, if you think that um, an original is important, then you will make a distinction uh, between even the most um, accurate copy. So you will say that um, many artists, particularly Victorian artists, would paint a picture uh, for a client and then paint another picture for a client because they wanted it in both their houses. Um, and uh, they would do that because they were asked to. Um, and they would both count in a sense as original. Um, but if you want it to really distinguish, you would just say, well, no, the very first one was authentic and the other was a replica. So I just very briefly, um, it's absolutely a matter of what you want to achieve with your definitions. Okay. Now, Clive, Clive Bullen uh, is curious about any tips on how to use authenticity in order to live a better life. But interestingly, uh, Charles Vermont made a point here about Heidegger's uh, version of authenticity. And as I'm sure you know, you're aware, Heidegger treated this, you know, quite seriously that um, being authentic was uh, didn't require some exceptional effort or discipline, it, like meditation or something. It was more about being yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. And in some ways, um, you had a wonderful uh, section in your book where you spoke about attention and William James uh, saying that we must reflect that when we reach the end of our days, our life experience will be equal to what we've paid attention to, whether by choice or default. So into that rich mix there, you know, uh, from Clive, any tips on how to use authenticity in order to live a better life? And from Charles Vermont, what's your take on Heidegger's version of authenticity, if, you, if you'd like to expand on that? Um, I think the, the William James quote that you use should be our absolute mantra that at the end of the days, you know, you are what you have paid attention to. And it is um, very much your responsibility to live the life as your authentic life as much as you can. It's a very 21st century view, but uh, in a sense, all the better for that. Uh, in earlier generations, I think you would have turned to something external rather than internal, uh, such as organized religion uh, or societal structure and behaved according to that. So I think we're very lucky to live in a time uh, where we can look internally. Um, and I think the Heidegger question, I think simply takes us into, I think that's something I would really like to take offline um, because um, there are so many issues to do with being yourself and there are particularly issues that come up um, as, as you get older, okay, um, so as, you, as you see an end in sight, um, as the questioner will know. Uh, Greg Davies, uh, hi Alice, is the current trend of green hushing, that is organisations saying they have environmental targets, but publishing little or no information on what they are or how they are meeting them, a lack of organisational authenticity? Oh, I think green hushing is very much due to a fear of being accused of green washing. Um, and in general, I, I mean, I don't know which examples he's thinking of, but I think the green hushers are wise in the same way that a, manage, uh, a manager might say um, under promise and overperform. So yes, a lot of companies do have internal targets that they're not declaring, that they don't want to be caught out on and they want time to work out, um, you know, whether, whether they are achievable. And I think there was a, um, uh, some research by Accenture very recently that I think came up with a figure that about over 90% of companies are not going to be able to achieve their stated ESG goals. Mm. So I think green hushing is, is not unwise and not inauthentic. I think it's quite sensible often. Okay. 
Uh, Hugh Purser, do, do con artists think of themselves as authentic? That's a really interesting question. Um, they think of themselves as cleverer than the, cleverer than the next guy. And they are often so self-centered as to border on the sociopathic, um, which puts them in a frame of thinking that whatever they do is more right or more clever. And, and I think, yes, they would possibly say, well, you know, we're, we, we'd all be con artists if we could be. Um, I think they would if asked, see themselves as, as pretty authentic in that sense, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, it, Robert McDowell again. Uh, it's very interesting. I, I, I wonder if Rob's read the book. Rob, you can tell me. But, uh, because in the book, you, you come to a really interesting point where you point out that because of the competition in life, people need to own areas of effectively intellectual property more than authenticity, but that this is related to authenticity. Um, and therefore they become far more, um, well, aggressive about defending their territory. Um, so Bob's asking, much that is authentic is refined over time. Uh, again, is it refining within and prescribed boundaries and with the approval of the owner, the critical factor in evaluating the refinement? Um, well, this plays very much to the first question uh, about authentic and versus versus replica. And I think in any definition or any refinement of what is counted as authentic or not, you have to ask in whose interest is mm -hmm. the definition. Um, and I think that unpicks it may be um, in someone's interest to very narrowly define what makes uh, uh, something authentic. Uh, and this is where we, 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 we do get into IP considerations uh, and, and I do write about those. Um, and the regulators or society, let's take the case of um, naturally occurring compounds um, that would make good medical drugs. Society may decide that um, those definitions of what is your drug, your intellectual property, um, your ring fencing is too narrow for the good of society. We may say it's absolutely fine for Ralph Lauren to keep a little polo symbol as being his, even though obviously there has been a, an American Polo Association for a hundred years and the, the Afghans invented the game 2000 years ago, but we let Ralph Lauren have control of that image. But there are other things where we think it's much more important that the control is 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 not so tight. Yeah, it's a it's a tough one for sure. I I personally have often wondered if we're too strong on giving away intellectual property and actually, in fact, not focusing on the authenticity bit. In other words, I created this piece of work. It is my piece of work and all that, but I don't own it. But anybody who uses derivations of it should at least acknowledge that I created it. We we seem to be missing that middle ground. It's all about ownership as opposed to effectively a kind of a chain of custody, which is also where you're looking at Artemis. If, if, if you think that the novelty of your, it doesn't, the novelty of, of what you've created may find an economic niche, it's in your interest to put a sort of picket fence of IP around it, but it may not be in society's interest. Now we've got a four or five minutes left and uh, I, I don't want to miss, in fact, one of the biggest bits in the book was I'm, I'm reading this book along and I'm actually, to be frank, at a couple of points getting just a little depressed, yeah. uh, particularly over the malarial drug <laughs> and all that. And then suddenly uh, you made a brilliant point about, uh, I think his name was Elliot, uh, and saying that actually just be a little careful here. Don't become a cyber miserableist. Do you want to explain mm. that and why that's important? Yes, I'd love to. I'd love to. So the person who said um, that he was not a cyber mistress uh, was Elliot Higgins of Bellingcat. And you will have heard of Bellingcat because they were the ones who uncovered um, the downing of um, MH, uh, MH17. No, somebody will correct me on the number of that, the, the jet and also the identity of the Skripal poisoners all through open source intelligence which of course uses the same digital technologies as the bad guys use. Uh, and furthermore, when I asked him what new and whiz-bang technology would help us 
in the world of open source intelligence, he said, it's not the technology, it's the people. He builds communities of people who, uh, I call them the armies of truth, um, who are all out there countering the cons and the conspiracies. Um, and I found that um, totally unexpectedly um, to be a cause for what I would call cautious optimism about the future. Um, and therefore I would label myself as a cautious cyber optimist. Yeah, very good. Now, um, I, I um, there was another bit in the book which uh, again intrigued me. Um, you spoke about uh, Mullerian evolution. Um, and so you gave in the presentation the example of the Viceroy versus the monarch. And yet what Muller uh, does is a zoologist is to say that actually everybody sort of piles in and uses the same coloration schemes and slight variations to sort of say, stay out of this area. And yet sometimes they're all poisonous. They're just sharing the, the identifier. Uh, we see the same thing in coral snakes and corn snakes when I was a kid in Florida. That was a very important distinction to make. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we would look at that. Now, uh, in some ways, we've got a whole area. I, I sit on the board of the United Kingdom Accreditation Service, so we are responsible for all the ISO brands and standards, which these are shared brands, aren't they, in a way, that people have created to spread authenticity outside of what a small organization can genuinely handle or defend and to share the load. Is that not correct? So you're talking about standards in terms of quality? Yeah, well, I've got, you know, I've got a stamp that says I'm ISO 9000 or I'm ISO 14000 yep. on that. Or um, the Corgi gas scheme was another one that, yeah, uh, yeah, that in fact, yeah. UCAS did, which says yeah. this gas has been installed safely. I'm just a tiny little gas installer, you know, one one man and a, and a van, yeah. but actually I'm running to bigger standards that you wouldn't think a small crowd like I could handle. Yeah. Yes, and it's, it is the, the most valuable thing because it allows them to signal, it's a, it's a quality signal. Mm -hmm. Um, it, if you like, the, the, the opposite of, of what the butterfly was doing, which was signaling, don't touch me, I'm poisonous. It's, it's signaling, use me, I'm trustworthy. Um, and it is, uh, it is a positive and genuine signal. So if you're looking in nature for positive and genuine signals, I would say, uh, look at the world of flowers, uh, which smell beautiful, have lovely colors, um, and promise nectar. And these are authentic promises, uh, because once you, uh, as an insect, you dive into that plant, you do, you are usually, not always, uh, rewarded um, with the nectar. So in the same sense, if you use um, an accredited um, artisan, uh, you've trusted, it's a trusted signal, and you will be rewarded. Yeah. Uh, so yes, it is a very important marker of authenticity of an authentic, so it's a very, actually a very good example. We, I talked about authentic products. Thank you for that. Um, it's, you can uh, also badge services as authentic. Yeah, well, it's, it's an interesting area for me because, you know, I've got an after, uh, after dinner kind of joke, but it's not a joke. It's about the, the entire diamond industry dep depends on women's mistrust of men. If they didn't actually go out and get the darn things uh, valued, because they've got no clue what the thing is, the man has no clue what it is, but we've normalized it to be a month's salary or two months' salary if you're in Japan, uh, that, that, that's it. And she, she runs off to get it valued for insurance purposes only, of course. <laughs> and, and yet, actually, she's going, my gosh, the guy's a cheapskate. He didn't need to give me a month's salary or he's a liar. He told me yeah. he, he was really, really well off. This is all they can afford is a month's salary. Maybe I don't want to marry him. Um, but the whole thing depends on something that nobody actually can genuinely see without a loop and a lot of training. So it, it, an interesting problem there. But I think this is the important thing. Authenticity is not just a, a sort of intellectual parlor game. It is that factual accuracy um, mm -hmm. and trust marks are what we all need to make every day reliable and predictable. And of course, business knows this better than anyone else. So it, it, it's not a um as i said it's not an intellectual parlor game it's what makes life livable um we're just going to try and go staccato here so there's a lot of good questions here very quickly uh julia george do you think large technology companies need to invest in an authenticity lead need to invest in a 
an authenticity lead, a director of authenticity or something like that. And what, technology companies? Yeah. Absolutely they do. Okay. Absolutely they do. And they need to stop not naming anyone at all, Mr. Musk. They need to stop laying them off. And I think, I think, funny enough, this is, this question is from Graham Elliott, and it's his namesake, Elliott, which was related to the, this question uh, as well. Do you have any thoughts about maintaining required levels of skepticism of other people without drifting into paranoia, your, the, the cyber, cyber miserableism? Oh, my gosh. Um, yes, what is a healthy level of skepticism? Uh, I think when I spoke about red flags, that uh, in the imposter I knew, I think certainly be alert to what I would call red flag behaviour. Um, and do be better than me. I'm, I'm an enthusiast. So one of the reasons I'm quite bad at spotting um, deceivers and Im imposters is that if somebody tells me that if the right three people die, he'll be Earl of Scarborough. You know, I want that for him. So I'm, I, 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 I need more scepticism. But I would say, yes, look out for the flags, but I think it's not so much of a fun existence to be too sceptical of too many people all the time. Yeah, well, Hugh points out here, you know, trust but verify the old German expression, you know, for trauen is gut, aber controller is besser. Uh, so yes, and uh, very good. Um, Bob McDowell, uh, your book opened, well, it didn't open, but very early on, at least, you had a lovely story of Lothar Mauskat and the mm. great forgery in Lübeck, which is just to die for. Read the book, people. Read the book. It's just great. My favourite. Uh, my favourite story. Uh, Bob McDowell points out another film by Orson Welles, F for Fake, in 1972, yes. which is also another one to, to look at. Yeah. Yeah. It's sad living, it yeah. to the end of time, so I'm going to have to call it quits. And uh, I might to point out, I loved it when you ended with cream. One of my father's favorite jokes is a guy goes into a coffee shop and he he asks he asks for a coffee. He says, "I like my coffee, you know, uh, but 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 with without cream." And the lady says, "I'm sorry, sir, we don't have any cream. Will you have it without milk?" <laughs> so so there you go. So that's authentic for you. Uh, right, folks. Well, very quickly, if I may, uh, a round of thanks very much to our sponsors, as ever, uh, wandering widely and freely. But uh, all of these brands that you see before you exist to uh, convey authenticity, that this is really the, the group that has that long chain of existence in history delivering things to you. So uh, th if this isn't about technology, and economics and finance, I don't know what is. Uh, a second thanks to the audience today. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, Lovely, lovely stuff in here you'll love to read, including uh, Alistair Hunter. Thank you, Alice. Very informative and useful uh, to your book, which I started on the flight home last night. So there you go. Uh, uh, as ever, folks, uh, do go to the website to check out uh, what's uh, lying ahead. I won't bother to read it to you because I know that you read faster than I can talk. Uh, but most of all, my thanks go today to Alice for taking the time to share with us uh, some of the softer edges of a book, but you really do have to read the book, honestly, absolutely super. Uh, check it out. I personally found it very thought provoking. Uh, and with that, if I may, Alice, I'm going to give you an authentic clap using our <laughs> Korean karmic clapper. Uh, our Korean karmic clapper is a, is a legend around here and it um, substitutes for authentic technology. Thanks. Uh, so. Uh, we really hope to have you again and uh, look forward to working with you, uh, perhaps on some projects down there at King's just down the road. Uh, anyway, with all of that, thank you so much, folks. Great thank start of the year for me and look forward to seeing many of you over time. And Alice, looking forward to seeing you again soon. Take thank care. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a real pleasure.